My friends, we must not, I think, deliberate about public interests in the same way as about private. No one of you at this juncture should have an eye to what is privately pleasant and safe, rather than to what is suitable and beneficial for the whole body of Romans. I am saying it because I have ascertained that there are some of the soldiers who themselves are talking to the effect that the war we have taken up is none of our business, and are stirring up the rest to sedition. Tell them then that it was not by staying at home, or shirking campaigns, or avoiding wars, or pursuing idleness, that our ancestors made the state so great. The later Romans likewise, and our own fathers imitated them, not being satisfied with their temporary fortune, nor content with what they had inherited. And they regarded sloth as their sure destruction, but exertion as their certain safety. Do not bring shame upon our father's deeds, nor let slip that empire which is now the greatest. We cannot deliberate in like manner with the rest of mankind, who possess no similar advantages. For them it suffices to live in ease, and with safety guaranteed, to be subservient to others. But for us it is inevitable to toil and march, and amid dangers, to preserve our existing prosperity. Against this prosperity many are plotting. Every object which surpasses others attracts both emulation and jealousy. And consequently, an eternal war is waged by all inferiors against those who excel them in any respect. When, accordingly, in the face of these facts, anybody says that we ought not to make war, he simply says that we ought not to be rich, ought not to rule others, ought not to be free, to be Romans. Now, no one of you would contend, I think, that these are not the right kind of ideas to entertain. If, however, any one thinks that the fact of no investigation having been made about this war before the Senate, and of no vote having been passed in presence of the Assembly, is a reason why we need be less eager, why did they, on the one hand, elect me to hold command for five years at one time, as had never been done before, and on the other hand, equip me with four legions, unless they believed that we should certainly be required to fight besides? Surely it was not that we might be supported in idleness, or traveling about to allied cities and subject territory, prove a worse bane to them than an enemy. Not a man would make this assertion. It was rather that we might keep our own land, ravage that of the enemy, and accomplish something worthy both of our numbers and our expenditures. So we, to whom is left at once the decision and the execution of the war, by turning our weapons immediately against foes that are actually in the field, shall not be acting in an unauthorized or unjust or incautious manner. I might as well tell you that even if some of you do hold opposite views, I, for my part, fight just as I am, and will never abandon the position to which I was assigned by my country. The Tenth Legion will be enough for me. I am sure that they, even if there should be need of going through fire, would readily go through it naked. The rest of you, be off the quicker the better, and cease consuming supplies here to no purpose, recklessly spending the public money, laying claim to other men's labors, and appropriating the plunder gathered by others. When they had been thus united, Caesar, for fear that by delay they might again become indifferent, no longer remained stationary, but immediately set out and pressed forward against Ariovistus. By the suddenness of his approach, he so alarmed the latter that he forced him to hold a conference with him regarding peace. They did not come to terms, however, since Caesar wished to impose all commands, and Ariovistus refused to obey at all.